I have to come here. I know you have to come here, but now that you're here, what do you want? You want the truth? Valium. Oh, you know, if you lied, you would have an easier time getting what you wanted. Welcome back to the Growing Up Punk Podcast, a podcast about punk rock and all of its friends. I am Aaron, one of the hosts of this show, and it is good to have you back and having you join us. If you enjoy what we are doing here, then please check us out on social media at Growing Punk Pod on Instagram and Twitter. You can find us at growingpunkpod.com. Uh, where we post videos and uh, what we're listening to and reading and all that kind of stuff. So if you enjoy um, diving a bit deeper into music and, uh, yeah, what we're all about on this show, then please check us out there. Uh, send us a message. We love to we love to hear from you. We love to know um, what you think of the episodes and what you would like to see on the show. So please feel free to, to drop us a line on uh, any of our social networks. Um, yeah, today's episode or interview, I guess, is with an old friend of mine, Ryan Latrue. Ryan played guitar in the metalcore band Before Today and now plays in, uh, I guess, kind of a more kind of hardcore band, um, Nothing Left. He is also a record producer and uh, just has been around the music industry and in bands for a long time now. And um, he's an old friend of mine, so we got to uh, tour together years ago in our respective bands. And so it was great to catch up with Ryan. Um, so we kind of decided to do something a little bit different on this episode. So instead of kind of going through the typical, you know, how you got into music and, um, you know, history of the band that he played in, we decided to, um, to talk about our... 10 favorite Face Down Records albums. Um, so both of our bands were on Face Down Records, and that's kind of how we met years ago. And uh, yeah, so we just decided to to talk about 10 of those albums. And uh, I, I will say, and I say it I think in the interview as well, that um, we aren't saying these are the 10 best Face Down Records and the most influential. These are just um, 10 records that we enjoyed. And uh, we actually touch on um, one of the Means records and one of the For Today records. Um, we kind of each picked each other's, um, which wasn't on purpose. Um, so I know it might come across as a little cheesy or whatever, but we, we genuinely enjoyed each other's bands. And so uh, it was kind of cool to just dive a little bit deeper into um, both of those albums. Um, so, yeah, I think that is everything. Um, yeah, we talk kind of about... Um, you know, what it was like being on Face Down, how we got signed to Face Down, and um, and then just, yeah, we kind of chat about each of each of the records going back and forth on those. So anyways, that's enough from me. I hope you really enjoy this, and thanks again for checking us out. Well, uh, today's episode is a little bit different. It's uh, going to be a lot less prepared since we just um, scheduled this yesterday. Um, because the guy I was supposed to have postponed, and so, um, yeah, still wanted to, to do something, and so I reached out to Ryan and, and asked if, because uh, we've, we've kind of been talking back and forth a bit about, um, about doing a podcast, and, and uh, so I figured, hey, let's just do it, and it might be different than it was going to look before, but, yeah, that's uh, what we're going for today. So uh, today we've got my friend Ryan Latrue, uh, he played in a band called Fort Today and also plays in a band called Nothing Left. Um, we met in the early, well, earlier 2000s, maybe like 2006 or something like that. So we were both um, playing in bands that signed to Face Down Records. And uh, yeah, we've kind of just kept in touch ever since. And so, um, so what we thought we would do today is go through some of our favorite Face Down releases um, and so I just kind of wanted to give a, um, uh, what's the word, like, a, not precaution, but uh, like a warning or whatever that, uh, yeah, disclaimer, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, at least for myself, like, I, I don't have any notes, which is makes me feel really odd because usually I've got all my notes and 
know what I'm going to say. And so, um, yeah, we'll just kind of be going off of just uh, whatever is on our mind today. So uh, I also wanted to say these aren't necessarily, you know, the most critically acclaimed face down albums or the most influential or whatever, like at least for the ones that I picked. I just kind of went through the discography and picked out the five that stood out to me that had kind of a specific memory to them. So, um, yeah, we'll just kind of go back and forth, kind of sharing about um, some of our favorite releases and why they're our favorite or if we have any kind of special memories with them. And so, anyways, that's enough talking from me. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for having me. It's great It's great to be a <laughs> part of a, an a, like an off-the-cuff podcast where we're just doing something fun. So that'll be a, that'll be a good time. And... Uh, yeah, we've known each other for a long time. I don't get to talk as much as normal or as as we used to back in the day. So it's cool to be able to catch up and uh, you know talk music and all that sort of stuff. So it'll be a good time. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you've, I mean, for those that might want to hear more of your kind of musical journey or what you're up to now, um, you've been on a number of other podcasts. Um, there was one specifically I just listened to on the Riff Filled Land podcast. Um, you and the host kind of go fairly in depth kind of your musical journey and how you got into music and all that. And so if you would like to hear more of Ryan's musical journey, then go check out that podcast. It's awesome. And so there's no point of me asking all the same questions <laughs> and, and whatnot. So yeah, if, unless you got uh, something else to add, we can just kind of get right into it. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm down for whatever ride you want to go on. So just let you just, you lead and I'll follow. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we we'll, can we'll even just do a quick kind of. Um, so, what year was it that for today signed to Face Down Records? I think we had officially signed um, in two thousand and eight, I believe, or it was either seven or eight. I can't quite remember. I do remember specifically that my brother was seventeen, so he couldn't. Uh, and my brother played bass in the band at one point and then later guitar but um so if you're unaware but um i remember it specifically because my mother had to have a line in our face down contract because he was not legally of age to sign a contractually binding agreement so uh it was kind of so your mom was signed to face down instead. it's true my mom my mom was <laughs> nice. uh, definitely a face down artist um which yeah so but uh was she on the face down family on the website it just said brandon and ryan's mom yeah it's just of- literally a photo of her <laughs> sitting at the kitchen table um <laughs> no um uh yeah so i think it was probably 2007 or 2008 we had kind of bothered them for a long period of time uh trying to get signed to face down and uh we had to convince them that we were i don't know maybe g- decent enough to grow into something worthwhile um because i mean if you listen to our earlier stuff uh it uh it, it took some imagining to i think to imagine uh any potential in in my estimation uh so they jason really was taking a chance on us because we were a, a pretty unknown real a really unknown band from iowa a re- middle america um, place which is really not uh, where a lot of I mean with the exception of Slipknot there's not really much coming out of there um, so it was it was really a, a, a gamble and a chance that he took that Jason and Virginia took on us so mm. uh, yeah I mean that was kind of where we, we had kind of bothered them over the years and sent them every demo that we would do when we were like 16 and 17 and growing up and then eventually um, we uh once we had um gotten maddie in the band and re-recorded vocals with him and things of that nature we had again reached out another time and that i think they were kind of convinced that maybe this could grow into something so they gave us a chance so that was kind of the initial jump uh, jumping off point for the band but it was around 2007 or 2008 yeah that's awesome i actually i have uh, some cool memories of so we played um with four today before um, before you guys were signed, um, must have been somewhere around Iowa. I don't know. I don't know if you remember that. That was with the old singer. Mm-hmm. Um, and then because we signed in, um, must have been late 2006, early 2007. Because our first album came out in March of 2007. So uh, we played Cornerstone that summer on the Face Down um, day or stage or whatever. And I remember you guys were there. I don't know if you were playing, but I can remember David. 
um, talking with him. So David was playing drums at the time, and him just saying how he was excited. He'd been you know talking to Jason there, and and so it was kind of cool, you know. Then you know then you guys signed, and you know then you kind of far surpassed, kind of you know all expectations, and so yeah, it was really cool coming up with you know a band of that you know of your your nature and just kind of seeing you from the start and then kind of seeing you know all the way to the end even though the band i was playing it ended a lot sooner than that you know i remained a fan of the band and you know came and saw you guys when i could and so it was really cool um just kind of following you know from the very beginning to the very end even though it was fairly sparse just based on my location but sure um yeah well so some kind of cool insight there yeah i mean man i think we toured with means if not like it was like means and a plea for purging i think we probably collectively toured with both of your bands more than any other band in our entire career because like there was what seemed like probably two years straight where it was just like if we weren't touring with the plea for purging we were touring with means and vice versa um it, it felt like that to me i don't know maybe maybe i'm misremembering but i just feel like we did def- definitely do a lot of early tours i know we did a tour with life in your way together and then we did some other like runs to and from things and just kind yep. of a lot of a lot of things like that um and uh you know it was it was you guys were always a lot better than us so it was nice to kind of uh, about that. <laughs> it, it was nice to you know i mean that uh, I, I mean i honestly do feel that way like uh it, but um in general i mean there's a lot of bands on face down in different eras um but really in all eras but especially that era of like where um you know bands like i like like y'all and a plea for purging, I think we're just so underrated in a lot of ways. Like you guys obviously had mm. fans and people people liked the bands and people came out to see you, but like I hear a lot of influence in bands that came after that like we're sort of standing on your shoulders and then rode the wave to a different place and you know um and that's 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 always cool, but it's always a, sh- a bummer when you know a band's great and you're like, oh, I wish people like got it um, as w- as well as they get it later. And another great example of that, it's not a FaceTime band, but the band Advent, I think, would be a great example mm-hmm. where I think the band had broken up and then everyone kind of caught on to it. Like, it, like they were the right. they were the band that everybody wishes they would have seen when they got after after they heard of them which unfortunately was a few years after they had broken up <laughs> um, yeah and i feel like that happened with lots of bands whether it was just face done or other ones you know sure just and I'll, and I'll share a little story of this later with when i share with one of the uh, one of my favorite albums um but yeah it's i mean what, what was cool with touring with with guys like you and uh plead for purging specifically and there was other like war of ages is it was just awesome to at least for us, because where we came from, there wasn't a lot of, of full-time touring bands, you know, in that genre. And so it was just awesome to find other bands that were just willing to, you know, just live on the road, just tour and tour, record, tour, just kind of do whatever it takes, right? And and so just awesome, just making memories, you know, meeting new people, traveling the world, um, you know, doing things that you know i never thought would be possible like you know like playing cornerstone or you know touring with life in your way and bands like you know that weren't necessarily like huge but to to guys like us from a smaller place like you know they were one of our favorite bands and so it was just awesome to to get those kind of opportunities and i mean you guys you know yeah. kind of like i said far kind of extended that as you kept going and you know got to tour you know with pretty much all of your um peers yeah i mean it was it, it was cool and i mean you know, I don't think it ever stopped. Like, as long as you stay interested in the kind of music you play, which not everybody does, but like, you can kind of maintain that like excitement about what you do, like, and uh, the bands that you're on tour with and the bands you're playing with, or in at, at the very least, find something you can enjoy or respect about the bands that you tour with. Like, it, it's just a better way to do it, and uh, it, you can learn a lot from from other bands and pick up things and uh, little. For, for me, like as a guy who likes to write songs, like I, I always enjoyed touring with different bands and kind of seeing how they did their thing. So uh, yeah. I definitely borrowed borrowed ideas from uh, from many bands that we toured with over the years. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I mean, every, everything's borrowed at one point, anyways. So and that's the way to do it, right? You at least you know the people, and you you know you're seeing it live. You're talking with them about stuff, and so it's. It all it all plays a part in it. So, 
But uh, yeah, well, that's uh, why don't why don't you start us off? What is um, one of your favorite Face Down albums? Okay, well, um, I'll start it off, and uh, I I when I when I actually we were talking about this before I listed a record, and now I think I have gone I fl- I've flip flopped a few times throughout the day just thinking about it. But uh, I'm gonna go. Yeah, well, that's all good. Nobody s- knows any difference. So. <laughs> same, this, the the same uh, band though. Uh, so the band is Take It Back, and I think the record I'm gonna go with that is uh, for, from them is Atrocities. Love that record. Um, I also was, I was between that and Can't Fight Robots, and the, those two records are just very different. But um, they both showcase things about the band that I really like, and I think. Um, made them unique to face down um, at the time because I mean they kind of with can't fight robots there was this like almost like dogwood like thing that kind of was, yeah. was kind of at the time not really happening but then there was also maybe like a set your goals um, kind of pop punk influence that was in there too in moments um, but then as they evolved into atrocities it was more like melodic hardcore leaning which I think I prefer in in general, um, but uh, both of those records are great. So I'm gonna give it a um, but yeah, but yeah. but um, I will I'll go with Atrocities on it. Um, and uh, you know that band. When I remember seeing them at Face Down Fest the first year that they w- were on it. I'm not sure the year. You may know better than I. Uh, but I want to say maybe like 2000 and eight or nine um yeah um but uh yeah they were kind of like the band that i had never really heard of um or heard much about um at the time i know we had played like with them in arkansas i think at the time previously but it was like they had kind of a lot of buzz um for 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 face down fest and i saw them uh sound check and i was just like whoa this band could be like the next comeback kid or the, a band like that at the time and of uh, you know, it didn't really like happen to work out quite like that. They had some member changes and changed their sound and did some other yeah. things. But uh, but I just thought the band was great. And um, you know, over fun fact, over the years, um, a lot of those guys in that band um have become very close to all the guys in my band. Um, specifically, their bass player is married to my sister <laughs> currently. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, and uh. So he's my brother-in-law. His name's Devin. He's great. Um, and uh, their guitar player Cody was our was the was for today's guitar tech for a number of years, mm. um, and uh, just was super awesome to tour with and hang out with. And he's now working with way way bigger fish. He's a guitar tech for Hozier um, and Thrice and Motionless and White and a bunch of wow. uh, very uh, successful bands. But um. But uh, anyway, Cody um, is great. Daniel Hawkins, our other guitar player, was our yeah. Dr- I remember that guy. He was our, he was our driver on Warp Tour one year. <laughs> so at one point, we we just had like all these guys are literally just a part of the family. So for that reason, as well as the fact that I think their band is good, take it back as the number five spot on my <laughs> on on my top five. Oh, uh, you're counting five to one. Okay, well, I didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna I'm, do that. That's see, we're we're, <laughs> just, we're just going random here. So, but I'm gonna yeah, go five no, to one because awesome. you know that's a that's a listable. Yeah, no, I definitely remember the Take It Back guys. I remember connecting with them well, and their drummer Josh was a really funny dude and a, and a cool drummer. And um, yeah, they were an interesting band. Like um, just with the changes from the first record to the second, you know, um, with members and sound a bit and. You know, I felt the second record, you know, didn't quite have the same production quality to it, and yeah, um, yeah, I always just kind of wondered what happened there. I, I don't, I don't know if I, if there's much of a story there, if it was just kind of whatever. I mean, that was fairly normal for lots of bands to, sure, you know, to do that. But I definitely felt being a little bit disappointed with, um, with atrocities r- right off the bat. Now, when I go back to it, I definitely enjoy it, but. Um, yeah, I guess it's just hard when you get that first record and it's like, okay, this is Take It Back. This is what they sound like. Sure. And then you get the follow up and it's like, oh, okay, this isn't what they sound like. And yeah, it's, it's just such an inter- interesting back and forth with, you know, especially a new band when you're trying to kind of grow your fan base. And then you kind of, you know, people may come see you at a show or they listen to you and it's like, oh, is this not the same band that, yeah, you know, I love the first time? Yeah, it's definitely tr- tricky, you know, that whole like expectations and, um feeding into them and like 
that's always an interesting thing to think about as an artist or as a producer or whatever. Now, um, as I produce other bands, it's like that you always have to consider like what the band is, what the identity is. And then also that where that intersects with the artist, like the artistic, uh, intent or the desires of the the creative person and like what they want to do. And sometimes like, I guess where you, where you land on that is totally up to you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's always, it's always tricky. I always say like, I, I always want like the bands that I really like to not change very much. Um, right. so sometimes I'll meet that with resistance and then other times, and sometimes later on I come back to it and go, you know what? I just wasn't ready for this. And, uh, it really grew on me. And I think like I had a similar thought when, when they changed everything up, but at, as time has gone on, I've grown to appreciate that more and more. So, I yeah. Think. Yeah. And I mean, lots of that, it's not like it was maybe a conscious choice, right? Like members move on, new guys come in, writing styles are a bit different. You just kind of have to go with, with the flow sometimes, even if it's, you know, a bit different. So sure. yeah, definitely uh, a unique, a unique band. So my first um, pick is one is a band that I really don't know a whole lot about, and that is a band called Falling Cycle, and their album called The Conflict. So why this one stands out is this is one that uh, that Matt, who played guitar and sang in Means, that he got. So this I think this album came out in two thousand two. So this was the year I graduated high school, and uh, I was still like super into. I mean, I still am, but back then especially, just mostly into like skate punk and uh, that kind of stuff and so I was you know I would kind of hear heavy bands here and there maybe on like compilations or whatever but you know I wouldn't really pick a heavy band to put on and so Matt got this album and I remember it just feeling like you know the heaviest thing that I'd ever heard or could imagine and uh, so I was really listening to it today and like it's it's a it's a pretty unique album like I think now it'd probably be categorized categorized wow (laughs) as like just metalcore but you know for coming on 2002 like it was almost kind of ahead of that whole metalcore metalcore curve you know it's it's pretty sludgy it's not like it's not super produced or even like that well produced Mm -hmm. um you know definitely at times the riffs are kind of similar to um you know metalcore bands that would have come later on but i don't know there's just something about it that is just kind of like dark and doomy and heavy. Like it's not like doom metal by any means, but mm-hmm. I don't know. It just stands out as, as just because I can still almost picture it. The first time I heard it, I was just like, man, like this is crazy. But there was something about it that was really cool. There was, uh, I think there was a song of theirs from that album before that album came out. It must have been on a face down sampler or something. Maybe it was on mp3.com or. And there was a part in it where he does this like really kind of high pitched scream kind of thing. Yeah. And then when they recorded for the album, it wasn't as in- as intense. And I remember being really bummed out about that, being like, "Okay, here comes this really cool part." <laughs> and then it was just kind of more baseline on there or whatever. But yeah, I, I never saw them live. They I don't think they ever had a follow up album. I don't really know. Yeah. Um, actually, I think one of the guitar players joined Sinai Beach afterwards. Um, so yeah, it, it's I mean definitely one of those albums that. You know, so that's why I kind of did that disclaimer of like, you know, these aren't necessarily like the best albums that ever came out, but just ones that to me, when I go through the discography and I see the name, it's like that one's always going to stand out. Yeah. You know, I still have it on CD. When I put it on, it takes me right back to grade 12 when I first heard it. And so absolutely, I just thought that would be kind of a, a cool, cool band and album to talk about. Yeah. yeah. When you told me about that record, I like went back to it because it had been a, such a long time since I had really like given it a listen. And it definitely has a lot of like that uh, at the gates, like slaughter the soul sort of like yeah vibe, but then like like mosh parts, like like just breakdowny, like like I call them VFW hall breakdowns, where everything's like all palm muted together. Dun-dun, yeah, yeah. Like they have a lot of those, and it's sick. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you know they they were like definitely. I'm not sure when Azalea Dying like came out. And, uh, and I think as dying is still a little, like a little less dark sounding, like they have a lot yeah. more, like, I guess it's more of like a melodic minor sound rather than like a harmonic, like, you know, uh, like the Swedish death metal sound that like is sort of yeah. in, in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I checked that out and I was like, man, this is like, I didn't realize for the time how different this was on face down. Like it was 
because face down wasn't doing a lot of metal records at the time yeah it was, yeah, it was more kind of hardcore and yeah and like punky hardcore even um yeah more more so so yeah that's a good call and like when, when you when you mentioned that one that was that i was on your your uh your top i was uh I, I had to check it out today and I was like, I kind of, it brought me back and I thought that was really awesome. So good call. Yeah. I, I almost wonder if they recorded it like to no click track, just because sometimes it like really slows down and just gets super sludgy and like, it, it's fairly, you know, sloppy sounding, yeah. which almost suits, suits the sound, but absolutely. Um, so again, you know, a lot different because, you know, maybe even when As Lay Dying came out, I mean, they were way more put together. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, a few years later, like, it was a lot more kind of like syncopated and um, just more kind of produced metalcore. And uh, so, yeah, just, you know, I think they were not necessarily before their time. There were bands kind of with that sound, but it hadn't really blown up quite yet. You know, it was coming mm-hmm. fairly quick after that. So, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely a cool release. Number four um, is going to be... Uh, the record from the band Sleeping Giant. Um, and this is like as far into narcissism as I'm going to go. Um, it's yeah, it's yeah. their last record, uh, I Am. And I was able to produce it and work with the band, recorded it and mixed it and all that fun stuff. But um, I was really thankful to be a part of it because I think Face Down and... Uh, that like the the whole this whole wave of face down that we were kind of a part of both of our respective bands was really like like sleeping giant really was very in, impactful and influential um specifically to my band on like the on the spiritual tip and uh you know i think they they were just as as people very um important to that scene at the time and uh yeah. Um, so being able to work with them on kind of their like their farewell record, which we knew was the case going into it, was really cool to kind of be able to, you know, I saw the the rise of Sleeping Giant and kind of them at the height of their their uh, their band's career, and then how much they meant to other people and how much the band meant to them. To be able to kind of be a part of helping them close this chapter of their lives was really really cool for for me. Um, as a, a friend of those guys and kind of a, yeah. You know, and, and, but also, you know, it was, it was really cool for me to be able to work on it because it was just a, you know, it was, it was a good record for me in my producing career as well. So it, it kind of had significance on a few different fronts and, uh, yeah. So I am sleeping giant. Yeah, that is, that is an awesome, awesome album. And, I was a little bit disappointed because my favorite Sleeping Giant album isn't actually on Face Down. Oh um, yeah, was, uh, um, Kingdom Days in an Evil Age. Yeah, like they they had gone to uh, Anger Anger Records or something, yep. and uh, yeah, then they came back to Face Down for the last one. But um, yeah, that that's my favorite of theirs. But yeah, this this last one is is awesome too, and and uh, so that's a kind of a good maybe segue into the next album that I was going to pick, um, and that was We Are the Threat by Death Star. Um, so a few kind of stories about, so uh, I think maybe like three of the guys from Death Star ended up being in Sleeping Giant. I think Jeff and Greg went to guitar, then JR was on bass um, in Death Star, then went to Sleeping Giant after. Um, so Death Star, yeah, this is, I mean, another album that uh, just kind of just stands out to me for a few reasons. So one of our first um, U.S. tours was with Death Star and Amur. And uh, so kind of going back to your comment um, earlier about, you know, some bands being before their time or um, or whatever. So on this tour, like super heavy music was where it was at, like mosh parts, people that were coming to those shows, like all they really cared about was just like, when's the mosh part coming? Yeah. And Means was not a mosh band by any means, pun by intended. By any means. Oh, okay. And uh, so yeah, I didn't actually think of that before I said it, but <laughs> and so the tour was really good. So a mirror, it was on their first album. They had signed to Victory. They were like just starting to really gain momentum. You know, there was lots of kids coming out to the shows, but we just stuck out like a sore thumb on that tour uh, because both Death Star and Mirror were much heavier than us. And uh, so it was, it was an interesting tour. It was super fun because I mean the shows were good. I mean not really for us, but just in general. 
And uh, both those bands were awesome. And um, I mean, we we connected with Death Star really well. Those were all awesome guys. And yeah. and what was cool about them is they had at that time at least three front men screamers. Yeah. And so like I don't know, it was like six or seven people in that band. So they were definitely a force. Like when they came on, like it was pretty intense. And yeah, they were like. And the I Wu- just remember they were like Wu Tang. They were like Wu Tang for yeah for, for like metalcore. Yeah, so like it, it wasn't. I mean, I, I was listening to that album again today, and I was really enjoying it. At the time, it wasn't necessarily like my absolute favorite, but there was just so many memories with that, and and then because of having you know the personal relationship with them, like I just the music grew on me. You know, seeing it every night and just kind of how hype they were, and the and the dudes were awesome, and so yeah, um, yeah, that, you know, it's an album that I don't necessarily you know go to all the time, but when I put it on, it just gets me pumped up. I mean, there's just like tons of double kick and breakdowns on it, and it's just such a fun album. And uh, I like I think they've released some music after that, but I don't think they ever had another full length because yeah, I think some of the guys went on to Sleeping Giant, and mm-hmm. um, it, it seemed like it kind of almost started as more of a kind of a joke for fun band anyways um you know i think they just they did a few tours but so anyways yeah, yeah um we are the threat by uh, death star is my uh, second pick nice nice um fun fact about death star is for years um because there's you said there's a ton of double kick on the record and you're totally right there's one beat that they do a lot that i that we just called the death star beat so whenever we were writing if there was like if we were trying to communicate certain beats is, you know, there's like the punk beat, there's the thrash beat, there's the blast beat, there's the two step. Um, and we had, and then we just like, that's the death star beat. And the death star beat is straight 16th notes on the kick drum. And every, every one, two, three, four on the snare and the hi hat, just dig it, 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 dig it. That's the death star beat. So we would just, every time, every time that would happen, um, that was a, the death star beat. So, they uh they worked their way into uh my brother and uh my uh vernacular when we were writing music just because of the prevalence of double kick and uh a specific beat that they happened to do quite a bit so Destiny. yeah there was uh on the tour we did with them they I, I don't know who it was that that recorded the drummers or whatever but they had a a different drummer on that tour with them and he was pretty young like he might have been you know, maybe 18, 19, if that. And, uh, I mean, I always just kind of gravitated towards the drummers. And, and so I just remember asking him, like, man, like, how do you, like, pull off so much double kick? That whole set is double kick. And, I mean, he he was an awesome drummer. And he kind of made it look fairly effortless. But there was a show we played with them uh, in Florida, a seven star. And uh, for some reason, Death Star didn't have a drummer. Uh, I can't remember why. And... And so I think um, uh, I can't remember the Seven Stars drummer's name. Anyways, it, it kind of came up like you know if, if I would fill in, I was like, oh man, like that would be a lot of fun. But I don't know if I could play my set plus that set with that <laughs> much double kick. So thankfully, the Seven Star uh, drummer filled in, and and it was awesome. It's it's the best when uh, you have when you get asked to fill in and someone else does it. That's a uh... It's a classic. It's just a, yeah, I mean, I can do it. And then someone else will do it. That's like, that's a, that's a relief on, on, it's just like, it's like procrastination, but like on, on steroids. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I don't think I'd ever, I can't think of a time that I ever filled in for a band. And so, I mean, it's a little bit intimidating. It's like, oh, okay. Like, you know, you might have, you know, a few hours or something to kind of listen through the songs, but Especially on uh, a band like that, I mean, if you don't pull off the parts, you kind of everything screw falls apart. The, you know the rest of things. So I was like, yeah, I mean, if someone else can do it, that would be preferred. So yeah, yeah. thankfully that's the way it uh, played out. Yeah, that's uh, oh, well, that's relieving. Yeah, f- filling in's not my favorite thing to do. I've 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 only done it a handful of times, and one of them was for the Ghost Inside on on uh, Warp Tour in, in Canada, actually, because one of the guys had a, a difficult time at the time getting into Canada. Um, so I was, uh, was the guy to fill in and it's so much more nerve wracking because if I mess up my set, that's my problem. But if I mess up their set, I've like disappointed them and all of their fans (laughs) as just some guy who was like, I'll do it. But you have to fill in the whole tour for them. Just the two Canada shows on warp tour. Um, Okay. So which yeah, two, two warp tour 
sets. So it was pretty, uh, it, it was pretty mild really comparatively to, uh, you know what, if I would have had to do the whole tour, it would have been tru- right. truly miserable. But, um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're great, great people. So it was, it was a good time, but doing uh two shows in on warp tour and then having to run from one set to the other, uh, on a couple occasions is a little, uh, nerve wracking. Anyway. Yeah, crazy. But. Yeah, so what's uh what's your number three? Number three is um and this is one that I like this is what I wanna split because it's because but but it's it it stinks because it makes it look like I'm kissing up to you, but uh it is what it is. Uh I'm gonna go to keep me from sinking means. Um but I labored over the decision um, you know, because really both of your guys' records are so good and, uh, I, I really enjoy both of them and they both have songs that really like take me back to a, a very fond place because like I said, we literally like learned how to tour while touring with you guys. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, and, and, and I think, uh, to keep me from sinking the, it's not the title track, but it actually is where the title d- track is derived from. The song "Steadily" is just—it's mm. just such a such a vibe on that song. It's just Matt at his at his best, just to be just killing it. And uh, you know th- that I like that record a lot because that was kind of you guys introduced a lot more punk beat into the into the st- into your stuff. Like it, there's a lot more of it on that record, which. Um, yeah, I really, uh, I really like. So, um, yeah, I think that record is great, and it is it's it's interestingly like you know you're talking about production and it being di- and like on the Take It Back record you're talking about it being a different type of production, and I yep. think you guys went much more organic on that record than uh, than you did uh, on the or than 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 the the record prior to it. Was that a conscious decision or was that like? How did that go? I'm going to interview you now for a second. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, I I think that's why I, one of the main reasons why I noticed that on albums is because I was a part of an album where that was the case and it wasn't really what we were hoping for. And so, I mean, even to this day, it's, it still bugs me. And especially because we never did an album after that. Um, Yeah. It was just one of those, you know, it, I mean, the simplest way to say it was just a learning experience. Like, you know, for a band like us, there's not a lot of, you know, producers up here. I mean, the guy who did Sending You Strength is from, um, you know, six and a half hours from here, um, who we're somewhat familiar with. Who's that? Um, uh, John Paul Peters is his okay. name. Okay. So he had done uh, the Comeback Kid album and Figure Four and um, a few other a few other projects. And so... You know, for that one, we kind of stayed close to home. And I mean, I, I still love the sound of that album. He's an awesome producer. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had done an EP before Sending You Strength, kind of the EP that got us signed to Face Down with him. Um, and so, yeah, I think we just kind of went to try something else. You know, we'd been on tour for a year and a bit. And and it was pretty rushed, you know, like we had, you know, two months off. Me and Matt just kind of got together every day and, and wrote and jammed and then um, the rest of the guys would kind of join because we weren't all from the same place. And, you know, this was before, you know, we had the ability to send, you know, stuff over the internet. And so a lot of the writing was usually done by me and Matt. And then the other guys would kind of join when, you know, most of the structure and the ideas were put together. Um, yeah. And so we, we wanted to kind of go with a different producer. And, um, and so I can't remember how we found this guy. Um, maybe as our manager or something, but he had worked with, you know, a number of bigger artists. He had done some stuff, I think, with the Chariot and uh, the Almost, um, and he had done a bunch of Victory Record stuff, and um, and so we kind of just took a chance. He was he was in New York, and so, you know, it was a lot different than just six hours away. It was a whole yeah, kind of cool. almost world away. You know, we never met him, and so we kind of went in blindly, And, uh, you know, we didn't really have time to do much like pre-production. You know, we basically had a friend come and put his computer in the middle of the room and press record. That that was our pre-production just so we could, you know, remember the songs basically. Sure. And so when we got to the studio, it was kind of this awkward like weird kind of expectations. Like uh, the guy who did it like seemed a little frustrated pretty quickly that – 
Um, like for myself, like I didn't play to a click track live yeah. and I wasn't even like, we weren't even writing songs to a click. We kind of, you know, would find a tempo um, just so we kind of knew approximately. But so it was always, I mean, I was never an amazing studio musician. And so it was definitely a challenge for me, you know, going in and, you know, it took me longer to kind of get drum stuff done. And um, anyways, it was the experience itself w- was good. Um, like the studio was super nice. It was a good accommodations there, but it just kind of, we didn't r- really gel super well with the producer. Like he kind of had a little bit different of a mentality. And I guess that's one of the risks you take when you go somewhere, you know, where you haven't met the, the person. Like sure. he just didn't really, really kind of get to, he didn't really seem to get what it was we were going for. You know, he would, come up with these different kind of parts that to suggest. And I was like, that's just really not what we're looking to do. Like maybe like these electronic parts or I don't know, just things that seemed really kind of out of place. And um, so, yeah, it wasn't like a conscious decision to have, you know, a less polished sound. It's just kind of the way that, that it ended um, with that. And so another funny little fact about that one is uh, the guy who engineered that record, uh, his name is Rich, uh, like Rich Liegi or something. He played bass in that uh, one-hit wonder band, um, t- uh, Weedus, that had that song Teenage yeah. Dirtbag. Yeah, classic. <laughs> so that was kind of a funny, like, okay. You know, so, I mean, he didn't come from the punk world either. and He was a super good, super nice guy, like did a great job. But, you know, it was just a learning experience for us. We just kind of went in and, you know, just worked with them and kind of did the best. You know, I think the songs were good. Um, and it's still, it still turned out okay, but yeah, I think it was a letdown and I mean, people definitely noticed it and, and Dylan's vocals had, you know, definitely changed in between just from touring so much and he was sick in the studio. And yeah. so, you know, there was definitely a few things that it just kind of is what it is. I mean, unless you just cancel it and go somewhere else and redo it, sure. you know, which, money, which wasn't mon- really, mon- a, yeah, money's not always a thing that makes it possible. It's unfortunate though. I mean, I, like I didn't really realize that you that you all felt that way about it. I didn't know if it was a conscious decision to make it go to go, to try to go a more organic route at the time. You know, with introducing punk beats and kind of they're not introducing them, but you know, leaning on them more. I didn't know if it was an intentional lean into more of like the uh, I guess not polished hardcore thing or not. And uh, you know, but it's unfortunate to hear that you you know you guys didn't really gel or felt rushed or whatever and you know i i know i know it's always like the worst on 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 my end like if i have if if a singer is having a hard time in the studio or is sick or something like i'll always just like wait (laughs) i'll wait because you know no one like no one wants to have to you know record while they're sick because no that you know no one does their best work when they're when they're under the gun or where there's pressure for like for time Obviously, you have to like work within time, but constraints on on some level because you know you can't do pull a Metallica Black album and spend a year in the studio or a year and a half or whatever it was. But uh, um, unless you have like a cartoon budget like they did, but um, right. But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, um, but I still think the record's great, and the point is, it's still on my it's still on my top face down uh, releases, and um, you know, so I think in the future. You just tell people that it was all intentional. You guys were just leaning into the organic sound, and it's just that was just your vibe. So I mean, that's what that's 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 like the effort, effortless cool guy, you know? Oh no, that's you just don't get it. That's that's what I was yeah. <laughs> well, it was I mean, and it was more so annoying that like you know people would gripe about it, but at the same time, it wasn't that much different than you know other bands. I mean, like there was a bands like Evergreen Terrace that you know kind of had a similar sound. You know, later on they had more polished albums, but at that point, you know, it was still kind of you know at least vocally, you know, kind of that high pitched kind of raspiness and yep. And so it's just I think because people were so used to it on the first one, everyone was like, oh, like what happened? This and this, and it's just like yeah, I don't know, it just kind of is what it is, and yeah. uh, I mean- so. Well, they're both great records. They both are, uh, yeah. They're the, anyway. I went back and forth between the two of them uh, because I couldn't decide, and uh, then I decided to stick with my uh, my my original gut, which was to keep me from sinking. Um, other side note, fun fact: as I continue to punish you about your band, um, is uh, 
<laughs> is that uh um yeah i mean i remember face down fest um watching like or not face down fest uh cornerstone night face down night on at cornerstone um one of the years um just being side stage for the entirety of your guys's set and uh i uh, maybe a couple years ago came across a video from that and i just saw a young haggard long-haired ridiculous looking version of myself <laughs> standing awkwardly behind uh, matt's guitar cabinets uh during the cornerstone thing and uh it brought me right back just to to get to, to watching matt and wishing i could sing as well as he did and the fact that you guys were a single guitar band that sounded as full and like it didn't have an emptiness to it was was a uh, pretty pretty unheard of at the time because it was just like dudes dudes are like adding third guitar players to bands and stuff at the time and like there was just it was it was like the age of how many full stacks can you have on stage like right. that sort of stuff and you guys just did more with less and I always thought that was really cool. anyway yeah. Yeah, and there's, I mean, yeah, I, I don't mind, because uh, lot, lots of that stuff is why I love the band so much, too. I mean, I don't have any shame in saying, you know, that I thought those things played to our part, too. You know, I and I love the two records we put on a Face Down because I they are pretty unique, you know, besides, you know, like a like a Take It Back or a Comeback Kid. Um, you know, there, there weren't a whole lot of bands really emulating that sound, Um and so yep. I, I do think it's cool to have albums on a label that kind of you know stand on their own. And so yeah, you guys were unique, um, and, that, and that that's what and that's and that and for that reason you are on number three on my top five face down records. records. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks. That's it's uh yeah it's cool to have an established musician like yourself think that. And so yeah, I mean even even just for the sake of talking about it, it's fun. Um, yeah, my, my next one is, um, going to be Dead End by Seven Star. I never, this was a huge Seven Star fan, um, but this album again came out, I think it was 2003, you know, I was just kind of starting to get a bit more into heavy music and, um, I saw this one at the bookstore or the music store or whatever that I got it at and, um, you know, I was kind of, I think the falling cycle one had come out already and a few others. Uh, so I was aware of face down. And so I think I listened to the demo of this one and it just really stood out to me. And, um, you know, it's more of just kind of a straightforward hardcore album, but, um, you know, it's got a good pace to it and it's, and, tough. uh, they're, they're, yeah, it's just, they're just yeah, lots of sounding. good, yeah, lots of good breakdowns. It's, you know, decently produced it's, it's catchy and so again i was listening to that one um today and and just really enjoying it again and so um yeah just one of those albums you know is it the best hardcore album on face down probably not but um i do like because they, they kind of changed their sound a little bit after that they got a different singer um who had kind of a, a different pitch of voice and um you know maybe went even a bit more like metallic influenced hardcore versus just kind of the old school hardcore sound and and so, yeah, I don't know. That one's just always been one that I find myself going back to and just always really enjoy it. I mean, we got to play with them quite a few times too, and they were awesome guys and always really fun to watch live. And, and they had some really cool albums that came out after that um, that I didn't get as much into, but still an awesome sure. band. And, and uh, yeah, so that, I mean, not a whole lot to say on that one other than, you know, it kind of made an impact on me just because of when it came out and when I got it. And yeah, and uh, yeah awesome a good one um uh, well we have come to number two on my top five list uh number two is well, it was debatably my number one because it like i i think i probably have listened to it more than any record that's ever come out on face down um and it is by the band my epic and it is their ep broken voice um and you know, I think Aaron would probably roll his eyes uh, hearing me say that it is that that's my favorite my epic record. Um, uh, but uh, because everything they have done is great, and you know, uh, yeah. and that's not to discount any of that, but just the that record and specific, like in, just specifically, there are so many lyrics on it 
that like it's it's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving i end up like hearing a lyric like years later and like it hits me in a in, in a way that i i understand uh what what he's saying uh, in, a, in a richer way and there's just so much wisdom in their lyrics there's so much thought and effort he puts into all of it and uh obviously his voice and the the the, the musicality of it is is beautiful and um but like just the the depth in in the songwriting that they went to on that record is is really uh something very special and i think for me um is all the best things about um like artistic singer songwriter leaning into um ambient rock band stuff that that, that band kind of does like that like that whole world of thrice meets circus survive meets uh as cities burn like kind of swirled together and like done with yeah. with uniqueness um to strip all of the like all, all of the guitar effects down and just have the core of it be there is really what that record does super well and uh yeah that that one's a a super super good record and one of my f- absolute favorites uh um, it, I'd 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 rate it as one of my probably top twenty favorite of all time records. Um, oh wow! So I think it's I think it's just so good, and I've just listened to it on repeat ad nauseum. <laughs> yeah, is that is that the uh, album with lower still on it? Uh, no, that's that that one's yet. It's the one that has alone, and um, it has the doxology uh okay um thing at the end of it and. Um, yeah, just a bunch of really, really great like story songs. There's a song called mm-hmm. Lazarus, um, that's that's really good. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, really, there's six songs I think, or five, five or six songs on the record, and uh, well, I think one of them is an interlude, so it's six tracks maybe, but uh, or something like that. But uh, um, but yeah, it's it's it just it flies by, and everything is good, and all of it is unique, and all the lyric, every lyric is perfect. So yeah. Yeah, though they're a band. Like I, I have those albums, and I, I go to them here and there. I, you know, it's it's definitely not as much kind of up my alley. I feel like lots of times with a band like that, you know, they're they're so gifted and skilled, and it's so good when I listen to it. But I almost don't have the capacity to like process um, music like that. Like even some of the newer bands, like Dens and. Um, you know, kind of some of those in a similar style. You know, when I, I listen to it, and it's like, man, like this is awesome. But it just, I don't know, maybe some of it just kind of goes over my head or, you know, at heart, I'm just kind of the simple, you know, three chord punk rock guy. So sometimes when, you know, it's too textured or too layered or, you know, just kind of too much to it sometimes, even if it's somewhat simple songwriting still. But anyways, awesome band, super talented, and I I wish I could appreciate it more. Yeah. Well, check out Broken Voice. It is less of everything. Um, I, I think for me it's the purest form of what that band is, uh, that record, yeah. that, that EP. And it's super, it, you know, it'll take 20 minutes max to listen to the whole right. thing. Right. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to go back to that one, but, but it's cool. It's for, for all those reasons. I really like that one. So what is your next record? Uh, number two is, um, Gideon's, uh, you, I think on your list, you had Callist and I had Milestone, um, both awesome records. I'll, I'll, I'll stick with Milestone. I, I thought it was an awesome follow-up to their uh, first album, Costs. Um, that one definitely intrigued me. Milestone, I feel like, really kind of solidified them um, kind of in their sound. I also think it was the when I first saw them live, I think they came through Regina here with Counterparts. Um, and then they actually stayed at my house um, yeah, I just I think it's an awesome, awesome kind of hardcore metal influenced hardcore album. There's lots of awesome breakdowns, well written songs. Um, the album art is awesome um, with with lots Definitely. of the album arts. Uh, shout out to Dave Quiggle who um, you know did most um, of the album art for Face Down, which yep. you know going back to talking about being signed to Face Down was one of the one of my dreams come true to have him do. Um, you know, multiple artworks for albums and shirts and stuff, and still to this day is my all-time favorite artist. So, um, yeah, I, I love the love the album artwork on yeah. this one as well. Yeah. Um. So yeah, not you know, again, not a ton necessarily to say about it. 
you know, song wise or record wise, but just an album that when I put on, it's always so good. Yeah. It's got really catchy, memorable breakdowns on it. And, um, yeah. And even, you know, Catalyst and uh, the album cold that uh, I think was one that followed that one. Um, all awesome albums. They've, you know, they've expanded their sound a little bit, um, on their newest stuff. And so it's lost me a bit, but, um, yeah, super solid band. Yeah. Great guys. Great band. Um, you know, and, uh, they've really like, I think they like they they put so much into touring and and uh, really like as far as that style goes, they just had really solid songs. Which is like at the end of everything, like having good songs is such it, it's the most important thing. And to, I mean, yeah. if you're if you're a band, and uh, I think that they, they've always done a really good job of. Um, having solid songs and good musicians and they play them well. And, you know, Jake's a great drummer. Tyler's a great guitar yeah. player. And I mean, even the other guys, Daniel and Blake and the guys who've played through with the band over the years, like just solid group of guys. Um, Blake now plays in, uh, counterparts actually. Um, oh, okay. but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a ton, ton of talent in, uh, that, that camp. And, uh, yeah, it's great to see that they're still, still uh going at it and uh you know they've taken some turns and you know obviously um every not everyone's always going to be along for all the ride but but like i am glad to see them like kind of going with their gut and going where they uh going where they feel uh like led to go in terms of uh creative stuff and you know whatever and just being true to who they are so um yeah shout out for that but uh yeah be true to yourself rock yeah, and uh, I can't remember, like, they were through here a number of years ago. Um, I can't remember. It was on, a, like, a, a bigger heavy tour, but for to me, they they were the best band that night. Like, they just played super solid. Um, they just kind of, you know, ripped through their set, but, yeah, they just sounded awesome. Um, I don't know if they were, like, playing to some tracks, like, but it just it sounded super full and and uh yeah it was awesome yeah i mean yeah, i love i love uh jake's drumming and and he pulls it off great live and so yeah again you know one of those bands that um you know on face down you know maybe would get lost a little bit even though they you know they've got enough of their own sound but um yeah they're just an awesome band that kind of keeps going so yep. yeah the good one so yeah so now we're we're hitting the number the number ones now yep. right yep we're at now we're at number ones and for me the the top face down record is Turn It Around by your Canadian Ken Comeback Kid. You stole mine. I, but that's okay. That's I, good. I, hey, I mean when you when, when it's the best, it's the best. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but man, yeah, I mean that record, you know, we were talking earlier in this about like not being totally ready for something when you hear it first. And when I first heard Comeback Kid, I didn't really know what to think of it at first because I had not really, I don't, I didn't really listen to a lot of like the punky, yelly, high pitched vocals with no, it was either yeah. like, it, there was no grit to it really. It was just, you know, Scott's vocal just being like loud and abrasive. And I didn't really know how to process that when I first heard it because I think that record came out in 2002 or something, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so. That would have been. I graduated high school in 2006, so it was pretty, uh, pretty early for me to hear that stuff. And uh, at first, I wasn't, I wasn't really, um, I didn't get it at first. But, uh, at, but then when it clicked, I realized how far ahead they were to just like anybody doing that style of like m- melodic hardcore, like they they are the masters of like the octave chord melody um, yeah. um, and just like over a punk beat as like there's power chords holding it down and, the, and there's like all this cool counter melody stuff that they do with um, with octave chords and uh, yeah I mean and they also you know they they, they, uh, they give you the mosh part which you know some of the other bands that were kind of in that world like the modern life is war bands would like 
tease the mosh part that never came that was like sort of their mm. vibe <laughs> and uh, yeah. and i think what made comeback kids so cool is that they would like they didn't do it all the time but they did give you the payoff which i always thought was really cool and uh lyrically there's always cool stuff in there there's little gems and like moments they were really uh to me like uh show that you could make a punk part or like any sort of like beat um catchy if you did their vocals in a way that accented the important parts in the right way um yeah and uh you know for making sing-along parts they really crushed it in that so that record as a whole front to i mean there's a like what seems like a gazillion songs on the record now because i think we're in the day and age of like shorter shorter records or whatever um yeah but uh there's just so many good songs and one of the best songs is the last song which is which is mm, yeah it's always cool which is always good yeah um it, it's not like the the afterthought they 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 let uh they all killer no filler so that's always yeah. a good thing which yeah is, uh, yeah that was a huge album for me too and they're still one of my all-time favorite bands they just are so consistent um, in their sound, but evolve enough, you know, to keep it interesting, but not so much that it loses the listener. And I just always get so excited to to hear new material from them. And what's uh, so a few kind of anecdotes about them? Like we didn't actually, um, even though they were, you know, kind of originated, you know, six hours from us, we didn't actually ever get to play with them live until like basically we were kind of on our last leg of our of our band. We got to open for them at kind of uh, their homecoming show in Winnipeg. And by that point, I think only a few of them even lived there. They'd kind of moved somewhere else. And yeah. and uh, so we kind of connected with them there. And, you know, now I'm, you know, connected with a few of the guys. And um, so, yeah, it was kind of one of those, you know, they were they were definitely like a step ahead of us, um, you know, in popularity and size and tours. So I don't think we were necessarily really on their radar. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was so, I mean, one of the reasons why we wanted to be on face down was because of comeback kid yeah. and, uh, but we just have such different stories. So their original bass player, Cliffy, still a good friend of mine. He, he left the band after that album. Um, but I just love getting to hear stories of that band cause they kind of exploded out of nowhere. Like their first tour that they did in the States, like was like sold out every show because, um, Comeback Kid started as a side project from Figure Four, who was also on um, on Face Down. Yeah, and also and, uh, so awesome. Figure Four had been touring the states, and they you know were giving out sampler CDs with his Comeback Kid songs on it. And then they must have gone on like MP3.com or you know somewhere for people to access them. But yeah, they their first tours in the states like were just crazy. Like it's just yeah. so weird, kind of hearing stories like that about bands. Um, and so that almost kind of gave us some, like, false hope. So it was like, okay, well, if Comeback Kids signed a face down there from around here, like, you know, maybe we can kind of, because they had moved, you know, by the time Setting Strength came out, they already had a few albums out on Victory or mm-hmm. uh, at least, yeah, one or two. And so we thought, like, okay, maybe we can kind of be that next kind of, like, torchbearer for melodic hardcore from Canada. And, and so, like I said before, like, at that time, it was just, like, beat down hardcore was the big thing. So, you know, it's such a time time thing, you know, when they came out, you know, Perfect that timing. kind of like, yeah, that kind of like, uh, yeah, whatever, you know, kind of type of hardcore that was, you know, youth crew hardcore, whatever was, was really blowing up, you know, lots of bands on Bridge Nine Records and, um, you know, but by the time Sending You Strength came out, you know, four or five years later, that kind of had kind of you know some of those bigger bands you know like have heart and you know I think they were still going but it kind of shifted a bit in the music scene and so it was definitely kind of disappointing um, you know and I I mean we were a different entity so we just kind of had these expectations and things just went differently for us so sure um, anyways yeah yeah I mean it's always it's always interesting because like you know like like you're saying timing is really everything when it comes to like. In any anything like but uh like you know specifically music stuff because uh if if the right thing happens at the wrong time it it just may not work and i mean that's why that's what's so interesting about a band like knock loose or something like uh where yeah. like you know they're doing a sound and to their credit it it really like it is something that is unique like that style of vocal over that style of music is not super common 
um you know it's kind of almost like hardcore vocals over like some like slammy death metal parts and disembodied yeah. riffs and some martyr ad stuff but like you know those kind of riffs happened in like the year 2000 like 99 and 2000 2001 and they're like bringing all that stuff back now and or you know over the last several years and yeah. uh they just happened at the right time with the right guys and the right aesthetic and charisma and all that stuff. And I mean, nobody <laughs> predicted that that band would be able to do the kind of numbers that they are doing now or, you know, yeah. Um, but it's just timing is everything. The And, you know, there's, there's all this weird stuff that happens like, you know, because there's so many things that play into it, but like, um, for a long time, bands did not play to a click track. Like you were talking about earlier, like you didn't play to a click track growing up and that was just how everybody did it. And then it sort of became a trend where everybody was on a click track and then music started to get a little more stale because there was no tempo changes and it was always static. You could predict like what four or five drum beats were going to happen. Right. So then now it's kind of, gone back the other way where bands are like maybe they're playing to a click track but the click track is just crazy (laughs) like all over the place and uh you know it's but just trends happen and things come and go and sometimes like if you get in like those weird in between spots you find yourself having to like try to adjust (laughs) to to kind of be be able to fit in somewhere because sometimes it leaves like these weird negative spaces for bands to not be able to exist really that well because nobody's looking for what you're offering or something. Right. You know? Yeah. And and obviously that's not, that's not always the case. And I think thankfully, like, you know, I don't think any, I don't think we're, any of the bands we're discussing have had that, like that problem to an extreme at all, but it is an interesting thing when you just think about timing being so important um to something really taking off or not because i think you know the quality of all of this stuff is all great and there's always been varying levels of success for all these artists so it's just you never know what you're gonna get yeah yeah no that's awesome well i'm gonna end it with uh returning the ass kissing favor right back (laughs) in your face (laughs) and uh, that is with for today's breaker album this is, I don't necessarily think it's um, my favorite for today album, but I mean, some of your later ones weren't on Face Down. Sure. Um, but Breaker is still, it's still the one that I come back to the most often. Um, it's probably the one I know the most. I can still remember um, kind of where it was when, I, when it came out. So I think this one came out... Um, wait, was this 2000? Because this just hit like a... Um, a mile mark, didn't yeah, it? Like ten years. Ten, ten years, yeah. So 2010, yeah. So uh, I mean, Means was done at this point. I was just back home working, had a kid. Um, so I could still picture like the house I was in when I when this album came out, and uh, yeah, there was just something special about it. I mean, I to me it was you know um, leaps and bounds ahead of, of Portraits, the album before. Um, not I mean not to slate that one I enjoyed that one as well but oh, yeah there was I just something uh, about Breaker um, I loved the uh, the spoken word parts in it not that I'm a big spoken word guy but I just felt you know it was just sometimes it's just those little kind of things that really differentiate an album or a band um, you know it just kind of created this really cool flow to the album and you know it's it's really powerful I mean it's it's one of my favorite um kind of albums in that in that vein or that genre and i just i love going back to it and and uh so yeah i would love to hear kind of some of your thoughts um you know maybe you've shared some of this stuff already but even just a few like when you guys were in the studio or writing this you know did it feel different or was it just kind of you know what felt like the next right thing to do or what um yeah i mean i think there was it was kind of this weird time like I, I think I, w- I would have been 21 when we were writing this. So it was kind of at that point and then where I we, we were like just barely adults at that point, you know? And uh, most of us were like either like 20, 21-ish. 
Um, and I think we had finally kind of figured out like what we wanted to do a little more. And, uh, like, I think that record was really what kind of solidified what the band was going to do and what we were going to like kind of be in terms of like what influences would work their way in. Like that record, I started singing a little bit more, um, like with kind of like, that's I, the first time I did any of like the sort of like pushed yelly singing where like right. you know, like the voice kind of breaks up sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, so that was, that was new on that. Um, which is, it's really, what's, what's also really funny is that there is repeating parts on that record, which if you listen to early for today, the first two records, there's almost zero repeating parts. Yeah. Like it's just <laughs> insane linear songwriting and, uh, it, and, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so, I mean, some people like it and that's, you know, whatever that that's great. I'm glad that they like it, but, um, but you know, when we went to, uh, work with Will Putney, who at the time was a pretty, um, r- a relatively unknown producer, um, he, he kind of showed us what a producer can be in terms of like seeing the good parts of your songs and saying, Hey, why does this happen once and never happen again? <laughs> like, yeah. uh, why don't we, you know, do that? And it kind of just helped me like understand songwriting in a better way because I had never had anybody be super objective and uh, critical in a, in a constructive way. Um, so I think that was really helpful to the project as a whole. And then, uh, you know, the, I, and to your point, I really did like the, uh, the, the, the poem that was kind of ended up being this like, tie through on the whole record it was kind of a tremendous pain in the butt to make work to be honest because it was like the dude just he he killed it but he just wrote this really like long uh poem and we cut out bits of it and just tried to make it work but it was like not to a click not it was just random free-flowing slam poetry so we had to bring it into the computer and like cut it up and write music that was in the appropriate key from from it, to go into whatever song it was going into. So there were several different like se- like vibes, to, and we wanted it to like have each like sort of a scene change. So all those required different tempos, different keys, different like um, uh, you know setups to land in the right places. And uh, after we had done the setups, then it was like, well, how do we make these words? not feel like they're totally clashing with whatever tempo now we're at. So it was a lot of like just painful cutting and sliding and cutting and sliding. And, um, but I do think like it really like did help give that record an identity. And, uh, while I don't think it's my favorite record we ever did. I, 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 I think it's probably one that, um, was, if someone were to say like, what, summer summarizes the identity of the band as it was um the best i'd probably put that up there uh as like that's when we kind of found our own identity more so at that point in time so to me that record is so i mean it's young and there's things i would pro- almost i mean there's always things i would rather do, or do differently but um but it uh it was an important record for us at the time and it really like you know dramatically change the trajectory of our band and kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm still making, I'm recording bands and making music for a living now. And I think that record in, in large part was like a, a big jumping off point for that being like, for that being a possibility. So, um, it's important for that reason. It's like, you know, it, it's still young, but it's like, it's got, uh, I don't know it's got some sort of character to it that, that I think makes it mm. cool. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a defining record for you. I'm sure, you know, when Face Down got it, they were they must have been really stoked to be like, okay, like this is, you know, I'm I'm just kind of putting words in their mouth, but I feel like if it was me running the label, it'd be like, okay, this is the for today that we've kind of been waiting for. You know, this is the for today that we, um, kind of hoped would would come out of you know the last few albums and. Yeah. Um yeah, do you do you remember like a significant change um you know whether in touring or fan base after that album or Yeah. like was it just kind of a gradual thing? Yeah, I mean it was actually pretty like 
So we got management uh, towards the like end of the portrait cycle. Like we had like a, we finally like, we were like self booked, self managed through a majority of that time. And then, um, sort of a lo- like towards the end of that album cycle, we got booking, which is Matt Anderson, uh, and who was yeah. at a different place at the time, but now Matt's, uh, one of the, one of the most renowned guys in all of like the alternative music booking world. He's, he's yeah, I remember do- that guy doing so good now. And, uh, and he, and he, he has always been, he was always great for us. And, uh, he actually books nothing left now too. So thanks Matt for doing me a real solid <laughs> on that one. But, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so we, so Matt started working with us and then Sean Keith, who, uh, at the time was the A and R slash like main dude at Sumerian records kind of responsible right. for that, like whole thing, uh, kind of, you know, being put together the way that it was assigned all the bands that you know really helped that label establish itself um so that was our team at the time and uh so it kind of coincided we got the, we we did a tour with we did we did a tour opening for Emure, stick to your guns evergreen terrace um and then right into a tour with winds of plague despised icon straight from the path a bunch of other bands um and we just had like these tours right kind of all happening um, in a row and we were just touring with all the bands we wanted to tour with, um, right as this record was coming out. So like we kind of got that, like fine, finally we're able to go like do tours with some of the bands that we'd been hoping to tour with. And, uh, you know, it just worked out really well, um, that it coincided with us making a record that, um, was kind of a more grown up, put together, well, better put together record. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we pretty, pretty immediately when breaker came out, noticed like the bump happen and like, obviously mm-hmm. all those things had to, uh, parts to play. We were just doing tours with, and playing in front of new people. And, uh, we, yeah, but I mean, you know, when we released devastator, I remember feeling like a specific, like, like, like a, a real push with internet hype around at the time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, when we started playing those songs live, it was just like it was very clear that uh, things had kind of shifted in a very positive way for us at that time. And uh, yeah, mm. I think that record really was a jumping off point for us. And then all the support tours came, and uh, it really, uh, really helped the band take off and get get to a yeah. good spot. Do you remember uh, or do you know how many copies that album sold? I saw, you know, I saw. So I'm like Facebook memories thing pop up actually the other day where at like, I think the first week number was something like 7,430 or something like that. So 7,400 something, um, was, uh, was the, uh, the number. And I only know that because a Facebook memory told me so. Um, and that was just for first week though. That, what was do you, any idea where it's at now? Um, I'm not, I haven't seen the numbers in a bit, but I mean, I think once it got over like, like into like that, like 50,000 territory, it kind of like 50. Yeah. I think it kind of slowed down after that, but, um, but you know, it's still like, it's still stream right now. No one really buys records anymore unless they're buying vinyls, but like, you know, it still streams pretty well. And, you know, Devastator still like, you know, our band, the four today hasn't played a show in four years almost. And, uh, you know, Devastator is still one of the top played songs and Seraphim's up there too. So yeah, um, those two songs really, uh, you know, kind of took on life of their own and sort of, you know, outlived the band, if you will. Yeah, man, that's, uh, that's, I, I wouldn't have, I mean, I'm, I'm so bad. At, that's why I like, I'm interested to hear numbers because especially for a label like Face Down, like I, I kind of feel like I remember hearing, you know, like, 10 to 15,000 was kind of like the higher end for a lot of um a lot of the kind of middle of the ground bands for them. I mean, besides, you know, they would have a few that would would sell more, but um so yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah. 50,000 albums. I think yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, don't quote me on that, but I'm like I, I know for sure it's over 40. It's between 40 and 60, but I don't I but it, again, it's been a really long time since I've looked at those numbers, but I think 50 is probably around where it's at. Um, I know, I know comeback kids record is more 
or it has been historically yeah. more that record had um granted um that was also eight years prior when people were purchasing records a little more and right you know I mean, even still, like today, like if you get to fifty thousand records, it's super hard to do. It's just way hard. It's way harder to get to those benchmarks now because people just don't have to buy records because right. there's no. Most people don't even like like if you listen to CDs, uh, you're you're a rarity at this point because Spotify and Apple Music and all that stuff exists. So, yeah, yeah. I'm still all about the CDs. Hey, I like I like see I like physical copies of stuff. I like to be able yeah. to like see the liner notes and um the uh the lyric books and the artwork and all that stuff. But yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, with you. and it's just more you know I don't I don't collect vinyl. It's too expensive, um you know. But CDs, it's like just uh about a month ago I had a an old friend give me his CD collection. And uh, so I got like tons of awesome punk albums and I mean, nobody's going to, you know, here, here, take my whole vinyl collection. Right. So I like CDs. Yeah. It's, it's accessible, but it's still a physical thing. And yeah, yeah, I still, I mean, I'm sitting beside, um, a CD player in my basement. I still love coming down here and just, you know, I organize all my CDs and I'll just pick a few out and sit down here and listen. And I mean, I still stream and stuff too, but yeah, I love just, you know, going through and be like, oh yeah, you know, seeing bands they thanked or, you know, all the things that I loved when I first got into music. So, Absolutely. but uh, yeah, any, anything else to add about uh, face down stuff? I mean, I'll reiterate that we realize that we are missing lots of records. So don't leave comments <laughs> saying, how could you not talk about this band? And we know there is, you know, as I was going through the discography, I was like, man, like there's, there's just so many, like there's so many you could touch on. And, but again, we've had a day to prepare. And so I just thought it'd be fun to just like, what are the top five that kind of pop in your mind or whatever? And, yeah. and there's plenty of others. So maybe we'll do another one some other time, yeah, but absolutely. Um, um, yeah, this has been, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks so much for sharing your thoughts and, and uh yeah it's just been cool to you know talk about each other's bands as well in there and just different experiences so that's been awesome absolutely and uh yeah and thanks for having me um you know it's 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 cool to be able like as two guys that have been in bands on face down um to really just be able to talk about like i guess before we're before we cap it off just how great of a label and great of people that they are at that label like i mean that's sort of this like sort of cliche that this labels a family thing, but it really like, it really does like feel that way. Like there's a camaraderie there. And like, you know, when, when my new band, which is nothing left was, uh, looking at labels and stuff. Uh, we had, we had offers on the table for a bunch of different places. And, um, when Jason approached, um, it seemed like a, a cool thing to do to kind of like go back and uh be able to work with them because to be honest i i wouldn't have the career that i have today if it wasn't for them taking a yeah. risk really and literally risking money to give for today a chance and uh so you know i, I at any given opportunity i will always sing the praises of jason and virginia and of course um dave and um shannon, and shannon uh just yeah. because that whole team of people have just really been like uh constantly supportive of uh people that they believe in um even if the even if like they don't think they can make money even if they know they're going to lose money they invest in people that they believe in as human mm-hmm. beings and i think that is a uh, unfortunately rare thing to happen uh not only in the music industry but in the world in general is people investing in people that they think are doing something worth doing yeah, yeah, definitely one of the hugest blessings for us. You know, there was at the time that we signed to Face Down, you know, there's lots of bands signing to, you know, labels like Victory that, you know, I mean, there's lots of stuff out there about Victory and, you know, and I'm just so thankful that, you know, for a smaller band like us, you know, we were still fairly naive and, you know, and so to, you know, get welcomed into the States by a label like that and all the bands. I mean, it was just a dream come true for us, and it, and it still comes up all the time. You know, I've been on a number of podcasts and stuff about talking about means, and it always comes up about like, what was it like being on Face Down? And it's just always such a such a joy to talk about it versus you know lots of bands where it's like, oh, like oh, you guys were on Victory, so you know this, this, and this, and you know, I'm just so glad. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to beat Victory. I mean, whatever. That's 
that's their own thing. I'm just so thankful I, I didn't have that experience and, you know, can still check in with with Jason or Dave or, you know, even if it's just on social media or whatever and yeah. and just to see it, they're still going and, you know, adapting to change and stuff. So anyway, shout out to those guys and, and to you and thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for your time on this. Really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Against every, every instinct of, of privacy, of self reliance that he has. And what do you do? What do you do, honey? You send him off on the street to score smack? Is that what you do?